Hello and welcome to episode 20 of the podcast, digesting the best of the week sports news. For this landmark sport unlocked, I'm Rob Harris in Porto and back in England is Martin Ziegler from the Times, not being able to get out to the sun. No, I think uh, you've uh, you've definitely struck lucky there, Rob. Um, and I think with you is uh, Tarek Panja from the New York Times. So how has your... Uh, Porto experience been so in the, in, the, in the few days you've been there? Yeah, Tarek is alongside me both out here for the Champions League final. First time we actually managed to record some of us, the pod, in the same place. Interested to be back out on the road again and actually we're broadcasting to you today from the UEFA Temporary HQ Hotel in Porto. Well, it hasn't been uh, without incident, Martin. Um, a few snafus along the way, particularly for me. I uh, arrived in Porto full of beans to, to be out and about again, about to check into the hotel, arrived and it was shut. The hotel I'd paid for <laughs> does not exist at the moment. Um, and it took, it took a while and a, a few frantic calls for, for, for Rob to tell me there was some room at the place he's staying at. So, um, yep, uh, in this new, environment we're all working in again things aren't as, as smooth as they used to be and encountering as well some of the ongoing coronavirus restrictions so although portugal has opened up to tourists from britain again out on wednesday night we were out having a meal and catching the europa league final and as we know it dragged on pretty late and the penalty shootout was starting just around 10 30 local time at exactly the point all restaurants and bars closed no excuses and we ended up having to watch the penalty shootout, at least partly through the window of a bar, which still had it on the screens. I thought you were going to say watching it through the window of radio rentals. We, we were trying to find the local rumbelows. That hotel experience, Tarek, is, um, sounds similar to mine in the 2002 World Cup in Korea, where I'd booked the official FIFA hotel in uh, turned up before a match. And um, I showed the taxi driver the, the address of the hotel. And he, uh, he had no idea where it was. So I went to the local information office and they said, oh, this, this hotel is 130 miles away. It wouldn't be, it wouldn't be one of these trips, I suppose, without, without the odd hiccup along the way. And I suppose, I guess, it's, it's, it's part of the journey and, and, and part of the story of, of, of covering events. Well, a very much shorter journey. We're actually staring at a sign which says General Secretary's Office UEFA. And we're seeing all the various UEFA officials all wandering around here at the UEFA hotel. But one thing noticeable from perhaps previous Champions League finals, there's certainly fewer of the sort of guests that are here flown into town, still subject to some restrictions. So it's not quite the party. They're not able to even hold big parties because there are restrictions, even when you're out and about, on tables of 10 to eat. So none of those big banquets that you get ahead of the Champions League finals. Although there was a, a dinner dinner last night, Martin, involving the, the president of, of Portugal, and, and senior UA for officials last night. So that type of protocol event still still takes place. Um, and there was still a, a police escort for, for the UA for luminaries from arriving from Gdansk where they, where they were at the Europa League final. Interesting. I mean, this is probably one of the, it's going to be one of the, the last um, standalone Champions League finals in a, in a city. I think there's, it looks like there's sort of, you, you've reported on this this week, Tarek, about the moves afoot to have a, uh, a, a week-long um, Champions League uh, climax where you'd have both semi-finals and the final in the same city, which um, I guess would, would, would solve some problems in terms of fixture congestion. And I think UEFA are looking pretty kindly at this idea. Yeah, the, it seems like this is going to be decided at the executive committee meeting at the end of the year in, in December. And certainly the hierarchy seem quite keen on it. So the, this comes after last year's finals the, from the quarterfinal stage had to be played in one place in, in Lisbon, in Portugal again. And it was without fans, but it, it, it went off um, quite successfully. And that sort of focused the minds. However, since published the story yesterday, there's been quite a lot of um, backlash from some supporter groups who think, you know, they're going to be gouged for prices with the hotels and, and, and tickets, etc. cetera, um, for two more games. Normally the semifinals are two-legged affairs and they're, they're held on a home and away basis. So, 
you know, but there's never going to be change without without opposition. Yeah, I was here last season when we had the final eight tournament in Lisbon, empty stadiums, unlike here where we at least do have up to 16,000 fans. And the actual format does create more of an exciting period, I think, having those final games of the, of, of the Champions League. I think it's not practical to have a final eight, but a final four does have a bit of sense of week about it because I think this build up to the Champions League final is sort of diminished in a way by the fact we've had the um, Europa League final as well. There's barely any build up and we're still all digesting the end of the domestic seasons on Sunday. The fact that obviously Lille clinching the French title, top four settled in England on Sunday, Atletico Madrid sealing the Spanish title at the weekend. There's barely any sort of breathing space to actually savour almost the Champions League final. So to actually give it its own week, own sense of occasion, perhaps even a party atmosphere in one area. There would be challenges if you did get big sets of rival fans perhaps gathering in one place, posing policing challenges. And we have seen some very minor issues here already in Porto on Thursday night between some fans. And that's probably one note of caution. But we are used in major tournaments to having lots of different groups of fans in uh, in a few cities. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's um, certainly be more exciting, I think, if you if you had one-legged semi-finals in a neutral venue. I think the, the, the two-legged issue, I think for semi-finals particularly, it is takes away something of, of the sort of thrill. So I, I, I think that is a, a positive move. Um, I mean, the, the other thing UEFA are looking at is is whether the away goals rule should continue. Obviously, that if it's only one leg in a neutral, neutral country, that that won't... Uh, that won't apply for the semi-finals, but it will for the other knockout rounds. Um, I did, did wrote a piece on this this week, and it's just incredible how split opinion is. Some people saying away goals rule is the best thing since sliced bread. Other people thinking it sort of causes negative defensive football. Be interesting to see what happens with that. I think they're going to probably have discussions are going to go on on this for some time. Of course, we had the oddity this season of the away goals rule counting even when both legs were being played on neutral territories. Yeah, crazy, you might say. I think it's been particularly awkward, actually, for UEFA this season having that rule due to the, as you say, the the, the fact that you might have uh, English clubs playing a, a, a home leg in, effectively in Hungary and, and vice versa. Of course, this Champions League final is taking place between two big spenders. Roman Abramovich's Chelsea, Sheikh Mansour's Manchester City. We await at the time of recording whether or not Sheikh Mansour will come to the game, which would only be the second game, I think, is attended in 13 years, only Manchester City. Of course, these two of the original Super League clubs and clubs that have also had their financial fair play challenges. Um, two big issues being talked about here in Porto, the future of financial fair play and the ongoing fallout from the Super League as well. Talking about the ongoing um, issues of financial fair play and the future of it, and the man who might be shaping it has just walked into a lift in front of us. Good afternoon, Andrea. Um, but the game, the, game, the game itself has already got a nickname. Um, you, Rob mentioned, alluded to the fact that uh, Chelsea is owned by um, Roman Abramovich, an oligarch, and uh, Manchester City by Sheikh Mansour, the brother of the ruler of Abu Dhabi, one of the richest states on the planet. It's, be, it's been dubbed the, the Kashiko. Um, and, and I guess there's something to that. And perhaps in light of the pandemic, et cetera, it's perhaps correct that these are the, the, the two teams in the final, the two teams that can withstand all the pain from the, 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 the cost of the pandemic. Uh, there's been um, you know, red ink all over balance sheets, but these are the last two clubs standing. And I think you know, um, there's something ironic in that and perhaps something long lasting too. And just see how quickly things can change in football as well. One year ago, Manchester City were facing the ban from the Champions League this season. They were going through Cass at the time, getting it overturned. Here they are, not only in a Champions League final, also hailed in some ways as saviours of the European football system by UEFA for, for aborting the, the Super League so quickly, being the first English club to officially announce they were renouncing it. And this week we've had yet another statement from Real Madrid, Barcelona and Juventus clinging on to that Super League vision and still not completely giving up and uh, showing they're in for a bit of a legal battle. Yeah, it was interesting. It was just now before we started recording, Joan Laporta, the president of Barcelona, has given his first press conference uh, since he, since he um, took charge of the club again. Um, and he 
he was asked about this and he said the club will not apologise and will not pay any fine levied by UEFA should there be one. And if there is one, they're going to go to Cass and he believes they're going to win at Cass. So the, the, this, this, this issue, this episode is just going to drag on and on. Yeah, so to me, I think they're going to... I, the way it's going to play out, I reckon, is that they will be banned. Um, they will go to Cass. They will challenge it. So they'll still be in European competition next season. But it's what happens for the season after that once the, the Cass has made its decision. Um, and y- you can see it's going to it's gonna drag out. But it's going to be quite messy. I'm not quite sure what the, the end game is for Juventus and Real Madrid and Barcelona. Do, is it the fact that they think they can cause enough trouble that UEFA sort of backtrack and does something to give them more money because they're in such a financial shambles? Um, or is, do they actually truly believe that they can um, force a, their their way through with some sort of Super League plan? I mean, to me, that's, it's you said they're clinging on. To me, I think they're clinging on to the wreckage of the Super League. And certainly, I think from the UEFA leadership standpoint, they don't want to be seen to giving into the trio of clubs now and certainly they can't have better peace conditions than the nine who've already accepted the forfeiting of five percent of UEFA revenue for a season as well as that combined donation of 15 million euros so it's how they get out of this now and what sanctions they're facing something I was thinking about whether or not one punishment could be that keeps them still in the Champions League is wiping out all their coefficient points taking it down to zero and by doing so, they'd all end up in the lowest pot of the Champions League groups. They'd face tough opponents. And also, they'd lose out on uh, many millions of euros of uh, revenue, too, from UEFA as a result of that. Yeah, I mean, that, that'd be fascinating, wouldn't it? And so, I mean, the, the coefficient is basically um, worked out on historical performances within European football. So, if, if you wipe that off the slate, then you have... Um, the big clubs who who who've sort of um, misbehaved if they if they're on zero, then they they not only do they ha- not get the seeding that they would have had before, but there's a, there's a, a fairly new cash distribution formula which was brought in about five years ago, which sees the 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 uh, a proportion of television money allotted to the clubs based on that historical ranking um, their 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 coefficient. Um, mm. This is always seen as something which is um, obviously favouring the big clubs and it was seen as at the time as a, a bit of a sop to try and prevent Super League breakaway talk. So ironic if that actually, uh, if your idea of going back down to zero on the coefficient would then hit them right in the pocket on that very front. <laughs> One aspect, of course, relating to coefficients is the reform of the Champions League for 2024 that's still on the table. And we've talked quite a bit about how the expansion of 32 to 36 teams could see the allocation of two of those additional four places being based on historic record in the Champions League and other European competitions, the coefficient. And had that been in place this season, rather than qualifying for the Europa Conference League on Sunday... Tottenham by finishing seventh would have made it into the Champions League but there are moves afoot now to no longer have that as part of the system for post-2024 in terms of allocating those additional spaces. Yeah well Martin that is clearly going to be a function of punishing these these 12 teams they've tried to leverage the power they have in the negotiations over the future of the Champions League while also trying to do the dirty with the Super League and they've shown their hand. They they have no leverage. They have no Super League, and there is no reason why the other clubs in Europe should allow them, should buckle and say, yeah, those two clubs, sorry, those two positions should be for for teams with higher coefficients. So that's gone. But going back to to the reason why Barcelona, Real Madrid, and Juventus are pursuing this, is I think people have forgotten there was an important court decision in Madrid on the Monday after the launch, the day after Super League launched, where a judge in Madrid had basically said UEFA, FIFA, any of football's organs, organisations can no look, can't take any action until this case of whether they are monopolies is decided. That judge has since taken, uh, sent that case to the European Court of Justice and the people behind it, not just the three clubs, but the company, 
who is organising a company called A22, is, is determined to see that through because it's worth testing whether UEFA and FIFA are monopolies. And to be honest with you, it, it is worth it for, for, for European football's sake to get some clarity as to how the future works. Maybe they will get further backing from, from the European Union and the courts, or there's going to be options for these teams. But it's good to have a final resolution. Well, one thing you notice around this uh, hotel is various deals are being done normally around the Champions League final and something that Tarek has an update on. Um, yeah, interesting. Little Pick up little tidbits around here and uh, quite a big TV arm wrestle is underway for the MENA rights. That's uh, Middle East and North Africa for the Champions League from, from next season. Being Qatari broadcaster, which has held the rights for, for a very long time, run by Nasser Al Khalifi, the PSG president and, and UEFA board member, is under pressure from a rival bid from Saudi Arabia. We're unsure where this, if Saudi wins, where it will be broadcast. There isn't a channel at the moment. Um, and um, the, the deal is also politically quite interesting because it's being brokered by um, an Israeli middleman as well. It kind of talks about the changing dynamics of, of politics in the Gulf. Um, and it's a big amount of money. It's about $600 million for three years. I understand the Qatari bid might be near that, but I think this, the, this Saudi number is higher. Um, and that will cause, ruffle a few feathers within, within, within the setup here. That's a, a really interesting one, partly for the fact, Tarek, that um, actually UEFA have made a submission to the US government um, saying that the Saudi should still be on their watch list for piracy. So if we have the situation now where the Saudis are bidding to buy UEFA's Champions League rights in the Middle East, that puts them in a very, very strange situation. Also, um, also Martin, what's strange is this game, Chelsea-Man City, the Champions League final, can't really legally be watched in, in Saudi Arabia because it's on BN. And being continues to be blocked and is illegal. The sales of new decoder boxes are still banned in Saudi Arabia. This is linked to the uh, the Gulf blockade, which has thawed a little in, in, in recent months. Yeah, and obviously, if anyone wants to catch up any more background on that, a few weeks ago on the show, we did have someone from Amnesty on, talking about how it all linked back as well to the Newcastle takeover and all the questions over human rights in the region. And it's a region that does have the World Cup in 2022. And the FIFA showpiece could be returning there as well soon after that. That's certainly an ambition, isn't it? Yeah, I just uh, learned that actually the, the, the Saudis have commissioned a, a, an American consultancy firm to um, create a team of advisors and devise a strategy to bid for the, the 2030 World Cup. Um, potentially that one or certainly soon afterwards um that could see them up against a joint british and irish bid a joint spanish portuguese bid and a south american bid so really um intriguing to see how that works out you know what we do know um from last week is that the saudis uh asked fifa to uh, consider holding the world cup every two years instead of every four this that might be explained by the fact that they are considering following Qatar, their neighbours, who they've uh, been casting envious glances at, that Qatar have got the tournament in 2022. And Saudis, um, I think probably with another partner, are now contemplating bidding themselves. Yeah, interesting. You, you mentioned another partner there, Ziggs. What, what I heard is that not just another partner, but another partner from another confederation um, hearing some whispers, it may be a, a European uh, nation who might be joined in that. And this kind of speaks to a little bit of Gianni Infantino's call for new ideas and, and wacky thinking, a bit like Dominic Cummings in, in Downing Street, if you follow British politics, who called for all sorts of new ideas to shake things up. And Gianni, any time he appears before a microphone, comes up with a new idea and, or has a call to arms. At his last press conference last week, didn't he say he wanted to start canvassing the world for, for new ideas, including including journalists. Yeah, and actually one of the big issues facing UEFA coming up is actually who will be the European candidate for 2030 World Cup bidding because you've got Britain and Ireland interested. You've also got the Spain 
Portugal candidacy being considered too, and that would completely split the European votes. And the challenge facing UEFA is how to unite Europe behind one candidate. And also, who do FIFA want? And as we sort of reflect on last week, those perhaps trust issues around FIFA and uh, can that and whose word can be relied on. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it'd be, uh, it'd be, if if you if you're thinking about having a, a European partner with Saudi Arabia, I think. Um, one that might be slightly toxic would be a, a joint bid with Belarus, who are due to host um, a Euro- European junior football tournament themselves in 2023, I think. Yeah, this has obviously been a uh, pretty significant week in terms of Belarus. We flew out to Porto on Ryanair, and Ryanair obviously controversially allowed a plane to be diverted to land in Belarus containing a journalist that they uh, are opposed to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Re- really, really shocking story that essentially um, a, a hijacking of a European airline in the way it was bought um, in very murky circumstances to land in, in, in Belarus and in the capital Minsk. There were allegedly KGB officers from Belarus on the plane. There was the journalist and his girlfriend. They were hauled off and then the plane uh, took off again. Of course, the IOC has already banned the National Olympic Committee leaders from, from, from Belarus in, in December after athletes from the country uh, complained that they were being oppressed following protests there by um, President Lukashenko, uh, famously described by Condoleezza Rice as the last dictator in Europe. He's been in power for 27 years and, and won an election in dubious circumstances last year and has crushed any type of dissent and has now... Um, Diverted the plane, detained the journalists, and and there's, um, there's fury around the world. Yet UEFA still has not decided what it will do. Other sports federations have 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 come out and 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 banned and, and sort of banned or cancelled events there. Martin, what do you think? Yeah, we've had the, we've had the European track cycling next month has been has been cancelled there, um, as a direct response to this this grounding of the, of the commercial flight. Um, so, I, I mean, I, I think this is going to be a really tricky one for UEFA to, to handle. And I'm sure that, that the first opportunity any of us get to speak to the powers that be there, we will ask them exactly why they're pushing ahead with this tournament so, as, as it stands. That's one of those big communication challenges that governing bodies like UEFA face when sports collides with politics. And actually... As we record this pod, we have some big breaking news. We're not known for our transfer stories on here, but we do actually have a big transfer deal now at the start of this January window as it approaches. And it's relating to FIFA. FIFA actually body that's trying to regulate transfers more. Brian Swanson is leaving Sky Sports News after almost two decades. He's been the chief reporter all over transfer stories, and he's going to become director of media relations at FIFA. Yeah, Brian has uh, been a stalwart on the sports news front, um, always there with, with his microphone um, from the days of Set Blatter all the way through all those um, ups and downs, the, the uh, crises, the scandals, and now he's actually going to be working for FIFA in Zurich. So um, good luck to Brian there. Um, it would certainly be helpful to have some somebody giving some very – plain answers so um, we, we will be hoping for that for, well, from him he'll certainly need a, a lot of luck martin the the average life expectancy of comms directors or senior comms officials at fifa in, in recent times has been about 18 months and uh, exactly walking by now i don't know if he wants to actually come on air is one of you his own communication staff thomas giordano is steering clear someone who stays away from the cameras and perhaps we'll get used to seeing Brian a bit more actually uh, at the front top table of those press conferences rather than being the person who's at the front row getting the first question in. He'll be sitting next to the FIFA president and one of the early tasks always for someone taking a job at FIFA is they uh, they have the tailors on the premises at FIFA HQ. They have to get sort of suited up getting the uh, the official you uh, the official FIFA suit on. One of my favourite FIFA communications director stories was with Walter de Gregorio, who was there at the end of the, the Blatter reign. And he was effectively sacked for, for making a joke 
um, which didn't go down too well with the Secretary General, Jerome Valker. So he told it live on Spiss TV at the height of all the FIFA scandal. And he said, uh, he said that the, F the FIFA President, Secretary General and Communications Director are, are in a car. Who's driving? The answer is the police. Feet didn't touch the ground, did they, Zeeks? <laughs> no. We're just lacking a laughter track here, or at least a crowd. Hopefully, when they're allowed, we'll be able to have a live studio audience for the pod. Okay, speaking of uh, football federations in, in trouble with the law, we're off to South America, where Comnebol, the South American Football Federation, under a, an entirely new regime after almost all of its members were indicted on corruption charges way back when, is having a little bit of trouble planning its Copa America. This is the main tournament for South America. And for the first time, they've aligned it with the Euros and they wanted it to be a real big hit. But that tournament is now under pressure for myriad reasons. It was supposed to be a joined effort between Colombia and Argentina. There's been massive street protests in, in Colombia. The situation there has meant that the tournament has now been solely moved to Argentina. And because of the COVID situation, the, the worsening COVID situation in Argentina, the, the, the tournament is under pressure. We're just weeks before kickoff. Um, Argentine officials are saying, look, um, we, we still want to hold it, but it probably can't be done with fans. Commonable, like UEFA, want this tournament to go ahead with supporters. There might be a last minute change with Chile, perhaps the most vaccinated country in South America, saying it's, it's willing to stage it. But again, so much uncertainty uh, with just weeks to go. Martin, I suppose that kind of uncertainty has been how we have kind of lived in the sports world for the last year and a half. Yeah, I mean, it, 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 now it just seems the norm in many ways, doesn't it? So. Um, yeah, you can see it's, it's, it's not going to be an easy one to solve. I mean, there's a few things going on, isn't there, down in South America. We've got Brazil, um, some reports there saying the um, one, of, one of those South American officials who were indicted for corruption, Marco Polo del Nero, has been secretly controlling the Brazilian Football Federation, um, despite the fact he's banned. Um, and we've also had some issues with Brazil's main football star, Neymar, with Nike saying that they, they dropped him because he refused to cooperate in a uh, internal investigation to an allegation of an e indecent assault. Yeah, we've had a statement from Nike on this saying they're deeply disturbed by the sexual assault allegations made by one of their own employees against Neymar. The alleged incident occurred in 2016 when Neymar was a Barcelona player. I don't think we've heard yet from Barcelona, have we today, Tarek? No, we've, we've not heard from Barcelona. We've not heard from his current club, Paris Saint-Germain, and we've not heard from his current sponsor, Puma. But we have heard from the man himself who is accusing Nike of lying. He um, put a statement out on his Instagram, uh, which has a picture of his leg and a tattoo of the word faith in Portuguese. Uh, and he goes on to say, to state that my contract was terminated because I did not contribute in good faith to an investigation is an absurd lie, he said. He said he was not given an opportunity to, to defend himself. He was not given the opportunity to know who the person that was making the allegation is. He said he doesn't even know her. He said he never had any kind of relationship or approach with, with the person. He also goes on to say that um, the incident that alleged incident happened in 2016 and he went with the same people to the same place in New York in 2017, 18 and 19. His father, Neymar Sr., who, who is also his agent, um, even accused Nike of blackmail over the contract talks. Neymar's reputation clearly is badly damaged. Nike haven't come across particularly well either, given how long uh, standing these invest uh, this allegation is. Um, the, the the employee continues to, to, to work there as well. It can't be easy on her. But yeah, an, an ugly situation that we probably haven't seen the last of. This could run for weeks and weeks. Yeah, Nike commissioned an independent investigation they're saying 2019, and that investigation was inconclusive. A statement saying no single set of facts emerged that enable us to speak substantially on the matter. It uh, goes on to say that Nike ended its relationship with Neymar because he refused to cooperate in good faith with the investigation. 
of credible allegations of wrongdoing by an employee. So now we do await perhaps what Paris Saint-Germain do say against uh, perhaps one of the most high profile employees of the club. And he recently signed a new contract, Martin, a new five year contract just earlier this month. Yeah, he did. He he nailed his colours to the, the Paris mast. Um, so I'm sure that they will stick by him. Um, talking of Paris, I don't imagine that Naomi Osaka will be tuning in to listen to us uh, because uh, we are members of the press. And um, while at the French Open, she is not going to partake in any press conferences. She's boycotting the press. Yeah, she's citing actually mental health challenges in terms of some of the questioning that actually players receive after games and believing it actually affects their performance, affects them personally as well, given the um, the environment that takes place in the settings. You know, we have heard from some other players too as well who are actually still recognising there is a role to the media do play and why they want to face the media. Absolutely. Well, it's an, it's, a, it's an important role. It's a vital role. Otherwise, it's just people playing sport with no one watching and no one engaging with them. The, the, whole, the whole kind of commercial operation of, of sports, more so now than ever before, is linked to all these engagements. The sponsors are, are, are putting their name behind these people because they're in the public eye. They're playing elite level tennis or whatever sport you want. And it's through their personality as much as their performance. And it was interesting, Rafa Nadal has come out and he's made the following comments. He said, without the press, without people traveling and writing the news, and our achievements, probably we wouldn't be the athletes we are today. We wouldn't have the recognition we have around the world. I understand her, but the media are a very important part of our sport. So it's it's pretty tough, especially for Naomi. She's got the um, she's saying she's got mental health challenges related to it. But how do you decouple sports from the the media environment? Yeah, I think it's very difficult. I mean. I- Generally speaking, when I've been to, to tennis tournaments, um, especially the sort of tennis regulars amongst the media, are, are very sort of knowledgeable and um, actually ask quite interesting, detailed questions about the sport. I mean, sometimes at Wimbledon you get um, you get news reporters looking for sort of slightly sort of more salacious, gossipy type stories, but I think that that's the exception rather than the rule. So I think it's um, it's quite, it's quite unfortunate for her if she feel if she's feeling that way. Um, I just hope other people don't follow that that path and, and actually embrace the media and think it's all part of the show. I think some of the way that the media athlete interactions are set up can make it perhaps quite intimidating for the athletes at times. The fact we they are often on a top table, we're at a distance in seats when we're not doing it on Zoom as we are now. So it creates quite a distance, quite a formality, where in fact very often it's a chat about sport and nothing really of great, you know, consequential magnitude and sense of bigger things away from sport have have happened. I reckon that would cut both ways, I suppose. You know, you, in the heat of the moment, you've lost a big match, you've or you've you've made a mistake and you've had to come off the field of play, whether it's football, tennis, cricket, whatever, and you immediately have to talk about the consequences or, or, or of your actions or what's just happened. And you probably haven't had a chance to reconcile what's happened on the pitch with yourself. And then you've got the white hot lights of cameras and microphones, etc., in your face. It, it, it could be quite, it could be quite tricky to, 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 to get the right words out. And that must be added pressure because every word counts. And perhaps that's a key thing because actually the way things are set up normally that a tennis player will finish a game and the press conference is held immediately afterwards, that it creates that system. Rather, actually, perhaps the players are more accessible. You might be able to sometimes speak a few hours later or the next day. And it, and it actually gives time to compute what is often a difficult situation if you've lost, if you've made a mistake, or you actually want to spend some time with your family too. So actually, more flexibility in the media-athlete relationship might actually avoid some of those scenarios that Noma Saka is trying to avoid. Mm. Interesting that she uh, she said this not long after um, going public with her views on the Tokyo Olympics, which she said she's not sure they, they, they should happen. Maybe an element of this is maybe there's been a bit of a backlash from some people in Japan who feel she's been some, in some way disloyal. Perhaps, I don't know, I'm just, um, I'm just 
theorizing about what what could be behind this um maybe she doesn't want to be asked about the tokyo olympics uh, on on any possible occasion during the french open of course one of the difficult issues that so often players do have to talk about we saw it after the Europa League final where Manchester United lost to Villarreal is the racist abuse that they face online and something highlighted by Marcus Rashford after that game just the the ongoing scale of abuse and the social media companies not clamping down on it enough Manchester United coming out with a pretty strong statement that was against any forms of discrimination any forms of hatred yet uh, this week I couldn't actually extract a statement from them condemning something on their own website which was the minutes of a fan forum involving obviously the supporters and many of the club officials, including Ed Woodward. And one of the fan representatives in minutes published on the United website talked about the type of owners they do and don't want. And this fan group representative said, I don't want to see the Glazers sell the club to some Arab billionaire, clearly singling out ethnicity of the type of owner that they don't want. I mean, and the comments published actually by United, he did say, I don't want to be like Manchester City, owned by a sovereign wealth fund. It's quite surprising as well to see Manchester United's own website recording minutes of a fan forum, criticising the ownership of their greatest rival in Manchester, as well as that issue in terms of singling out ethnicity. That's slightly embarrassing, isn't it? Something they would, I'm sure they would have wished hadn't been spotted by somebody quite so eagle-eyed as you, Rob. I mean, it, there there are obviously issues for, I mean, I think one of the interesting things about greater fan involvement amongst clubs is that you're going to have situations where people are sort of quite outspoken. We, some, we have actually seen in the last week some really, really furious things from the official Chelsea Supporters Trust directed against UEFA, for example, which, um, and I think clubs are going to have to accept that that's going to be part of their furniture and they're going to have to get used to it. Yeah, it'd be interesting to see what the fans do in the stadium. Are there any protests here in Porto at the Champions League final against UEFA? Do we also hear Manchester City fans booing the Champions League anthem, something they've not had a chance to do since uh, before the pandemic started because there have not been in any Champions League games. And uh, of course, this just the start of a challenging summer for UEFA, getting this Champions League final on and then the Euros. Yeah, it's been a it's been a long year for for UEFA and any all the football organisers. I think on the whole, um, they've managed what's been a pretty impossible situation quite well. National leagues are now finished. We're at the end of the club season with the game, uh, the Champions League final, and then we head to the Euros, which again they had to have last minute adjustments, and they probably still wait, make adjustments throughout the season. But you know, it looks like. By June, July the 11th, when the final game is, is played at Wembley Stadium, we might have a, a complete European football season. And that, I, I would have thought, would have been a tall order when we think about where we were a, a year ago. Well, for you guys in, in Porto, have you, have you tried a glass of port yet? No, we're staying very professional, working all the time, staying perfectly sober as we uh, report on, uh, on this game and, uh, and the build-up, of course. Excellent. Well, it's uh, great to catch up. Well, one of the good things about being out here is actually being able to bump into some of our listeners face to face and mention they're listening to the pod, including a big hello to Patrick Nelson, the chief executive of the Irish Football Association. He's really enjoying the pod, he said. Well, hopefully until we have to mention any issue affecting his association. It's funny what people say to your face, Martin. Well, that's very good. Well, actually, I've got, I, I can use this this uh, as a... As a uh, opportunity to apologise to Patrick Nelson because a few weeks ago I referred to the Irish Football Association being the uh, the governing body of the Republic of Ireland when of course the Irish Football Association is the governing body of Northern Irish football so uh, I've been meaning to put that one right for some time so here we are Patrick um, keep listening and apologies for that our feedback section as ever and if anyone's got any thoughts as ever on the pod hopefully not complaints anything we could be discussing you can always email us sportunlockedpod at gmail.com or we're at sportunlocked on twitter instagram and facebook for now martin great to speak to you from afar enjoy the final from back in england Tarek. Great, we could record this in person for the first time, at least two of us. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, more of this. Hopefully, we'll be doing it as a trio 
one day soon. And thank you everyone for listening. As ever, gratefully, if you could rate, review and subscribe to us. But for now, enjoy the sport in the days ahead and we'll speak to you soon.